Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Steve Curta. I am a veteran of U.S. Army for over 30 years. Today is the day three of honoring her hurt, whereas first two days brought attention to the honoring the hurt and set the stage, I believe today is the most important day since we'll discuss how the community can band together to serve our honoring the hurt that we talked about past two days. Seven organizations represented today is just great sample of organizations throughout state and in our United States uh, as a whole. We have hundreds and thousands of organizations that serve our military men and women, veterans, family, and caregivers. And these seven organizations represent, represented today are just tip of the iceberg. I ask that each organization come up and provide overview of your organizations. We will set aside roughly about 15, 20 minutes or so for questions and answers at the end of all the presentations. And for those of you joining us via uh, virtual, please use Q&A or chat features if you have any questions or comments. And for those of you in the audience, during the Q&A segment, raise your hand and someone will recognize you. But before we begin, I would be remiss without recognizing and honoring our POW MIA. For the past three days, when you enter this auditorium, you may have noticed a small table, a place of honor. It's set for one. And this table is a way of symbolizing the fact that members of our profession of arm are missing from our midst. They are commonly called POW MIA, but we know them as brother and sisters. They are unable to join us today. So we ask you all to remember them. So if you would rise and bow your heads in moment of silence. Thank you, please be seated. Again, we have a great program, a program book set up for today. And first up, we'll jump right in. Illinois Joining Forces. Illinois Joining Forces is a statewide public-private network of government and private veteran-serving organizations working together to improve services for currently serving military men and women, veterans, and their family. As a standalone not-for-profit organization, IJF helps service members, veterans, and their families navigate through very difficult sea of goodwill to find the support they need when they need it and close to home. And we realize that no one organization can do it all. And we also believe that veterans shouldn't have to wander from office to office or website to website to determine who does what, which your organization can best serve us. And this is where the IJF comes in. And to tell us more about Illinois Joining Forces, we're very fortunate to have Mr. Jim Dolan. He is the Senior Director of Development for IJF. Jim heads up our outreach to veteran serving organizations around the state. He has been serving veterans for the past 13 years and he declares his MOS as civilian currently serving. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jim Dolan. Thank you, General Gerda. Good morning, everyone. Just wanna take a moment to fill in some of the things that General Gerda talked about relative to IJF. But the very first thing I wanna make sure that you know is the number, the number that we use and the number that I'll be repeating throughout this presentation, 833-INFO-IJF, 833-INFO-IJF. That's the number to call if you are a veteran, service member or family member or caregiver in the state of Illinois, we're here to serve you. So first of all, who do we serve? 
Illinois Joining ser Forces serves all branches, all eras, all manner of discharge, service members, active duty guard and reserve, and family members, caregivers, and survivors. So when we say all, we mean all. So what do we provide? We refer to what we provide as the way of services, and as General Curtis said, navigation, is we refer to as holistic resource navigation throughout the state. And our job is to direct veterans, service members, and their family members to the resources they need when they need them. So what we do is we do our very best to partner with organizations, both veteran-centric and community-based, to make sure that veterans, their family members are connected to the services closest to home. And we really believe that services are best delivered close to home. And we'll talk about our connection to the community where we can do that. So what do we do? We have two care coordination specialists, Michael Smith, Navy, William Bryant, Marine. And these guys do a great job of wrapping their arms around the veteran and family member to make sure that they get the services that they need. They're available Monday through Friday from eight to five. They can be reached at our call center at Illinois Joining Forces email. They can be reached at IllinoisJoiningForces.org. We have a get help button. So if any veteran that you know needs help, you can put in a request for assistance for them or they can put in the request themselves. So what makes us a little bit different? We're not just a resource directory of services. We have relationships with all of our partners so that we know who we can talk to in the community and how we can make an intelligent referral. These relationships give us an opportunity as we go through an intensive intake process to make sure that we triage the client's needs. Very seldom does a veteran come to us with a single need. Oftentimes, there's two, three, or four items that they're working on. So part of our job is to help to triage those items. We take the most urgent first and work down the list. And one of the things that we observe is that just by knowing that somebody has their back, somebody is there to assist them, it takes, you can see that their shoulders come down. It gives them the opportunity to realize that they're not alone in this and that somebody is along their side helping them to navigate. And then we make sure that we have a warm handoff to our partners within the community. Some of those here present are our partners, but we have dozens, literally dozens of partners throughout the state. And then we go down the list to make sure that each one of the partners that we connect to is taking care of those needs. So we have a motto that we call care, but don't carry. So we understand that our partners are working tirelessly to help veterans, oftentimes in a particular silo. That's, that's, a, that's their area of operation. That's what they work on. So adding additional work to their load um, makes it very difficult for them to stay focused. So part of what we do is let our partners in the community know that they have a backup in IJF. So we ask them to take a minute. If you're talking to somebody about employment, if you're talking to them about housing and that's your lane, take a minute at the end of the conversation to ask the question, is there anything else that you or your family might need? The difficulty with that is that if you ask that question, you're gonna get an answer. So by the time your day is done, you've added three or four or five things that you need to do in order to meet those requests. With IJF as your partner, you have the backup. So no matter what their need might be, you don't have to carry it. You can care enough to ask the question, but you can hand it to IJF to go through that process of triaging those needs. So at any point in the conversation, that veteran or family member can be referred to IJF for follow-on care. So what it does is it gives us an opportunity to make sure that our partners and IJF are interconnected to be able to work as a team. As General Curtis said, no one organization can do it all, but together we can get the job done. So I wanna talk a little bit about our initiative that began several years ago called the Veteran Support Community Initiative. What we realized was that there were a lot of organizations who have been around toiling in the fields, working with veterans for quite a few years, 
And the two things that they lacked was recognition and financial support. So IJF has been able to connect with these community providers, these community collaboratives to provide that support and oftentimes to be able to deliver financial support. What it does is it allows us to be able to foster better collaboration through our care coordination center. So any one of our community partners, community collaboratives can reach out to IJF at any time to provide that backup that I referred to earlier. What it also does is gives us an opportunity to share resources and share assets. We wanna make sure that Illinois Joining Forces knows as much about the community as possible, but Illinois is a big state, a very rural state. So the only way that we could really know who the boots on the ground are is to make sure that we're connected to these communities. And the key ultimately is to make sure that we stay connected. So this is a little graphic that talks about some of the outposts, some of the veteran support communities that are either established or in development. Uh, so we're going from uh, all the way up from Rockford down to Southern Illinois to make sure that we have boots on the ground that we can reach out to. We don't know everyone in every community. We don't know every resource throughout the state, but by connecting to local community collaboratives, we can learn the local intelligence about what's available in the community. So I really just want to end with this. When we're out into the community talking to our partners, we often quote Lincoln from his second inaugural, where he said that we are to bind up the nation's wounds. We are to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. And when he said those words, we don't think that he was talking about a federal bureaucracy. We don't even think that he was talking about the VA. In fact, that didn't become the motto of the VA until 1959. We believe that he was speaking then, and he's speaking to us today through history, that we are to care for him who may have borne the battle. We are to care for his widow and his orphan. That means all of us. So, there has been some legislation proposed to change that motto to care for those who shall have borne the battle and for their families and survivors, which includes caregivers. Whether that motto is actually adapt, adapted or not, or adopted rather, to become more inclusive, we really believe that it's a matter of the culture. We believe that it is we who are to bear this burden of caring for those who have served for us. So we as a community, we as a, a nation, when we say all, we have to mean all. So I'm gonna repeat the number, 833-INFO-IJF. Remember that number, if a veteran, family member or service member is in need of services, that's the number to call and we'll make sure that they're connected to the resources that they need and deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Next up, Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs. Mission of the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs is to empower veterans and their families to thrive. They do this by assisting them in navigating the system of federal, state, and local resources and benefits by providing long-term health care for eligible veterans in our veteran homes and by partnering with other agencies and not-for-profit to help, to help address education, mental health, housing, employment, other and other challenges. With us today to provide overview is Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs Veteran Service Officer, Mr. Anthony Hernandez. He serves as a subject matter expert on federal, state, and local benefits and programs that are available for our Illinois veterans. So, Mr. Hernandez, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here. I am a proud Navy veteran and a veteran service officer that works for the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs. Thank you for including me in this program for today. 
to assist veterans in navigating the complex web of services and benefits that they have earned, the IDVA provides veteran service officers, fellow veterans who are experts on federal, state, and local veterans resources, as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as benefits offered by partnering organizations. Female VSOs are available in many offices throughout the state, if needed. Our VSOs are trained and accredited by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs to provide free assistance for veterans, their dependents, and survivors. This includes not only for applying for federal and state benefits, but also providing resources related to the following, compensation and pension, healthcare, education and training, employment, burial and survivor benefits, housing, permits such as hunting and fishing license for those who qualify, transportations and military records. Additionally, the state of Illinois has always offered property tax benefits to veterans. These are the Returning Veterans Homestead Exemption, Disabled Veterans Standard Homestead, um, Specially Adapted Housing Tax Exemptions and Tax Exemptions for Mobile Homes. Veterans should contact their county tax assessor's office to apply for those benefits. The IDVA veteran service officers can also assist in veterans with more information on regarding these programs. In closing, I'm sorry, in closing, um, I would like to thank you for allowing me to be here. And um, if you have any more questions, if you have any questions at all, I'd be more than happy to answer any of y'all. Thank you. Next up, Jesse Brown VA Medical Center. Jesse Brown VA Medical Center consists of 200 bed acute care facility and four community-based outpatient clinics. Jesse Brown VA Hospital is affiliated with Northwestern School, uh, Feinberg School of Medicine and University of Illinois College of Medicine. Jesse Brown VA Medical Center provides care for veterans residing in the city of Chicago and Northwest Indiana. With us today is Ms. Jess Jessica Heiss, is licensed clinical social worker and community engagement and partnership coordinator for suicide prevention at Jesse Brown VA Hospital. Ms. Heiss, welcome. Jess, come on. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, General Curta. And my name is Jess Heist. I'm the Community Engagement and Partnerships Coordinator for Suicide Prevention at the Jesse Brown VA here in Chicago. And it's, gosh, it's an honor to present today among such a passionate panel with such accomplished people. Um, I'm a social worker. I'm a registered yoga teacher. <laughs> and suicide is part of my lived experience. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Odom, for the invitation to speak on a subject that's so close to my heart. I'm gonna show a quick video that should provide an overview for Suicide Prevention 2.0. And afterward, I'll talk more about the programming and its impact and how you can get involved.
Okay, so like the video said, you know, veterans do not live, work, and serve in isolation from their communities, the nation, or the world. They're our bosses, our neighbors, our barbers. They are the community. Um, so the issue of suicide in the U.S. today also affects the veteran population. And let's face it, this COVID-19 pandemic has been brutal to us all. We lost our sense of connectedness. Many of us are jobs, our loved ones, and even our sense of purpose. And while the news is compelling and recent data around suicide stats are heartbreaking, the reality is that the number of veterans in VA care who die by suicide has been historically decreasing. So it's clear that the time for collaborative action is now. And that's why we're working with an extensive network of community partners to utilize the best resources and best practices and support all veterans and their caregivers, including those who may never come to VA. No one system can prevent suicide. This is a shared responsibility. And as such, VA has adopted a comprehensive public health approach to ending veteran suicide. And it's one that looks beyond the individual to include peers, caregivers, family members, and the community at large. You saw it in the video. We, we know we can't do this alone. Roughly half of all veterans in America aren't receiving care or benefits from VA. And that's why we've got a partner and we've got to do it now. <clears throat> this public health strategy called Suicide Prevention 2.0 uses an upstream approach. And that means that rather than jump in the river to rescue someone, we want to cast a wide net to catch them before they ever fall in. Yeah. This requires less resources, less energy, and it can reach more people. So the hardest time to intercept someone is when they're already in a state of crisis. So in the few minutes to follow, I'll outline this public health strategy and the programming that makes it possible for you to get involved. In accordance with the Action Alliance, CDC, SAMHSA, and many others, the VA's national strategy for preventing veteran suicide provides us with this framework for identifying our priorities, organizing efforts, and focusing on the national um, plan to reduce veteran suicide. Suicide Prevention 2.0's community-based intervention model promotes the three priority areas you see on your screen in alignment with research suggesting they might be helpful in reducing suicide rates. Priority one, identify service members, veterans, and their families, and screen for suicide risk. You know, you go to the primary doc in the community and they may not be asking you these questions, but doing so enables culturally responsive care and then access to the right resources, the resources here today. And we know that enhanced suicide risk screening in healthcare settings allows providers an opportunity to recognize and then prevent self-harm. Priority two, promote connectedness and improve care transitions. Without a doubt, feeling connected to each other is a protective factor against suicide and providing caring contacts upon discharge from one setting to another can decrease suicide attempts and increase treatment adherence. Priority area three, increase lethal means safety and safety planning. Limiting access to lethal means during a period of crisis can make it more likely that that person will delay or survive suicide. Um, and we know, um, Completing a personal safety plan or crisis response plan, it can be called, is a clinical intervention that helps folks to mitigate their stress response and reduce suicidal feelings. Using these three priority areas, community-based intervention serves as a unifying model, and it casts that wide net to reach veterans at the national level all the way to the folks next door. So nationally, what are we doing? VA is conducting cutting edge research, funding multimedia campaigns and partnering with the National Shooting Sports Foundation. They're also deploying community engagement and partnerships coordinators like me in VA medical centers all across the country. Our aim is to support and enhance organized community led initiatives at ending veteran suicide. At the state level, Governor's Challenge is a collaboration between VA and SAMHSA where state policymakers can partner with local leaders to create a comprehensive suicide prevention plan that works in their community. 
And I have the honor of serving on the Illinois Governor's Challenge. I'm seeing firsthand our state's dedication to reduction in suicide. Together with veterans is an awesome <laughs> opportunity. It's a peer-led coalition and leadership program that has some funding opportunities in rural areas of the state. And alongside community engagement and partnerships, you might be aware that your local VA also employs suicide prevention coordinators. And these folks are the real deal. They provide clinical and case management services to our most high risk for suicide veterans. Together, we reach out and educate the community all while preserving their critical role as frontline mental health staff. And if you've noticed, community is at the center of all this. So if we don't have our community support, our mission will fail. Yeah. <laughs> Locally in Chicago, I have the pleasure of standing up community-led coalitions, one such coalition zero, which is a collaboration between academic institutions, healthcare and wellness providers, veterans and civilians alike, who have come together for a common mission. And that mission is to reach all service members, veterans and their families with a message of hope. We wanna bring the suicide rate in Cook County to zero and we need your help to do that. So I'd like to thank you so much for your investment in eliminating veteran suicide. And we really treasure this opportunity to work with you. Um, the next slides are just some resources. I don't wanna talk through them too much, but they will be included and sent out to those who would like them. So thank you so much for having me today. Great. Thank you for providing that great resources for everybody. Uh, up next is VA caregiver support. Caregiver support program supports our nation's veterans by providing education, training, resources to caregivers of veterans. To present this segment, we have Ms. Catherine Miller. She is a licensed clinical social worker at Jesse Brown VA Medical Center. Catherine's role is to provide the program of general caregiver support services to the caregiver support program. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Catherine Miller. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catherine Miller and I'm a licensed clinical social worker at Jesse Brown VA Medical Center. And I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak to you about our caregiver support program. Caregiving is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. I was a family caregiver for my father who was a World War II veteran. And even with my training as a licensed clinical social worker, it was a hard journey and I understand the caregiver perspective and I'm honored to be able to support caregivers. Let me go back here. Oh, okay, so some, some, some statistics on caregiving. Nearly five and a half million caregivers nationwide are caring for former or current military personnel. And almost 96% of those caregivers are women, but 70% providing care to a spouse or a partner. 30% of veteran caregivers provide support for approximately 10 years or more compared to 15% of caregivers nationally. Almost 88% of caregivers report increased stress or anxiety with 77% noting that sleep deprivation is a major concern. So we see the impact of the role of a caregiver on the caregiver and the caregiver support program aims to support caregivers in their journey. Now, the mission of the Caregiver Support Program is to promote the health and well-being of family caregivers who care for our nation's veterans through education, resources, support, and services. So we believe that the best way to support a veteran is to support the veteran's caregiver. And the pillars of our program are inclusive care, and I believe you'll be hearing more about that from the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, but in brief, Inclusive Care is a joint initiative between the Elizabeth Dole Foundation and the Department of Veteran Affairs, and it aims to formally incorporate the caregiver 
in the veterans treatment team. And that's very important. Many providers actually depend on the input and the information from caregivers in treatment planning and, and monitoring adherence. So we aim to make that a formal process. Second pillar is education and training for caregivers. We provide various uh, caregiver training and education and support groups for caregivers, give them an opportunity to interact with other caregivers. It can demystify some of the uh, conditions that veterans can um, go through. And it also provides them an opportunity to uh, actually help other caregivers. And that's really important because most caregivers I know have gone through that experience and what they really wanna do is help other caregivers through that experience. Uh, trusted partnerships, like many of you, we are currently looking to develop and enhance our trusted partnerships because the VA has a lot of resources, but we cannot do it all alone. And the community-based resources are vital for our caregivers. And we strive for excellence in service in all that we do. Now the caregiver support program has two distinct programs under the umbrella. There's the comprehensive program, which the long phrase is program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers. And that requires an application. There's an application and assessment process. And it's designed for veterans with moderate to severe personal caregiver need, needs, who without the daily assistance from a caregiver would be at risk of inst institutionalization, having to go into a skilled nursing facility or assisted living facility. And this provides a monthly stipend to approve caregivers and acknowledgement of their role as caregivers and also supportive services to the caregivers are provided. Now there is also the program of general caregiver support services or PGCSS and I coordinate that program. And the distinction between the two programs is that uh, the general program does not require an application or uh, an extended uh, assessment process. And it's open to veterans with any level of care needs. As I said before, the comprehensive program is designed for veterans with moderate to severe personal care needs, but the general program is for veterans with any level of care needs. And it also provides supportive services. Um, pretty much everything that's available to the comprehensive program is available to the general program participants. Now, um, the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers went underwent an expansion in October of 2020. And that was made possible by the Mission Act of 2018 that authorized the VA to extend the PCAFC to Viet veterans who served in the Vietnam era or prior. Before the expansion, this program was only open to post 9-11 veterans. Um, we call it the expansion, but personally I call it an explosion because um, we had an influx of applications which really amplifies the needs. So many uh, veterans at Jesse Brown, if you've ever been to Jesse Brown, you will see a lot of Vietnam era veterans. They're a huge part of our population. And we've received, um, I believe over 500 applications to date for, for this program. And we will be expanding even further in October of 2022 to include all service errors. So in October of 22, all errors will be eligible for PCFC, but there is an administrative eligibility that we can talk about. Now, the eligibility criteria for PCAFC, the veteran has to have incurred a serious injury or illness in the line of duty and have a single or combined connect, service-connected disability rating of 70% or more and served on or after September 11th or on or before May 7th. 1975. We also accept veterans who are undergoing a medical discharge with a date of discharge established. Matter of fact, we did have a, a, a young veteran, uh, OEF, OIF veteran, who was undergoing a medical discharge and he applied. And shortly after his discharge was processed, he was approved for the program. So we were really happy to hear about that. Now, the reason that a veteran needs personal care does not have to be directly related to the service related injury. We have veterans who are service connected for things like PTSD, but as you know, um, serving veterans of the Vietnam era, many of them have uh, age-related disorders such as Alzheimer's and dementia-related disorders, and they need care for that reason. The, uh, the service connected requirement is just an administrative eligibility, so we're happy to be able to uh, provide 
um, resources for veterans who have dementia, uh, other functional impairments or cognitive impairments. Now the veteran has to be in need of personal care services for a minimum of six continuous months. Now we say that to say that, um, for instance, if a veteran would need personal care services for a short time, say post procedure, post hospitalization, then there are other programs and services that meet that need. Our program is designed for veterans who have a long-term need for personal care services. And those personal care services have to be needed because of either an ability to perform what we call activity of daily living. And those include bathing, feeding oneself, dressing, ambulating, uh, toileting, and things like that. So those are the kind of activities that without assistance could put a veteran at risk of institutionalization or they can qualify if they have a need for supervision, protection, or instruction. And that's usually for some type of uh, cognitive impairment, like dementia, some severe forms of mental illness will require a veteran to need daily supervision and protection and instruction to maintain them safely in the home. Uh, or um, we have a couple of veterans who have seizure disorders and need daily supervision to maintain their safety in the home because they frequently uh, experience seizures. And the main, another main requirement is a veteran has to be receiving the care at home. That's the whole point of the program is to allow veterans to remain at home under the care of a family caregiver, as opposed to having to go into an institution. Now the benefits and services are many for, uh, for the program of general caregiver support services. We have telephone su support groups. We have this wonderful, uh, feature called any text messaging where caregivers can receive text messages. Hey, have you, have you taken care of yourself? Hey, have you eaten today? And things like that. Training and education programs for caregivers, peer support, mentoring, a caregiver can be matched with an experienced caregiver and receive mentorship as they go along their journey. There's a national caregiver support line that's staffed by trained clinicians that can provide linkage and resources and just somebody to talk to. And of course we partner with our very valued uh, internal partners and suicide prevention to provide suicide prevention training for caregivers because many caregivers are the front line in many cases for suicide prevention. And that power of that relationship is very vital in suicide prevention. And there's self-directed care courses because not every caregiver can, uh, can, is able to attend an online or in-person class. So there are online self-directed care courses that um, caregivers can enroll in. Uh, there's beneficiary travel, uh, enhanced respite. Respite care is something that's a part of a veteran's benefits package, but the caregiver support program offers additional respite benefits. Health insurance for caregivers who do not have it, counseling services, and a monthly stipend. Now there is an application process and um, what, we, what we'll do is the, the information will be provided to you. There's an online application. Um, you can actually apply in person. And eligibility for the program of general care caregiver support services in brief is just the veteran has to be enrolled in VA healthcare and he, the veteran has to require personal assistance with the activity of daily living or need supervision or pr protection or instruction. No service connected condition is required and all service areas qualify. So we can cover any caregiver of any veteran enrolled in healthcare services for any reason. PGS enrollment, uh, the general program doesn't have the comprehensive assessment, but there is an enrollment process. You can contact me or our triage line at 312-569-5865. And there's a ass brief assessment and then you're enrolled. The services for PGCSS are very similar to PCAFC. So you get everything basically except the stipend. And this is our wonderful staff, just a brief shout out to them. And we all work together as a team. So once again, to our caregivers and veterans, we thank you for your courage, commitment, and compassion. Knowing what it's like to be a caregiver of a veteran, a family caregiver, we commend you and we're here to support you. And once again, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Catherine, for providing that great resources. 
Up next is Elizabeth Dole Foundation for Hidden Hero Initiative. Elizabeth Dole Foundation is preeminent organization empowering, supporting, and honoring our nation's 5.5 million military caregivers, consists of spouses, parents, family members, and friends who care for our America's wounded, ill, or injured veterans. Founded by Senator Elizabeth Doe in 2012, Foundation adopts a comprehensive approach in advocacy, working with leaders in public, private, not-for-profit, and faith communities to recognize military caregiver services and promote their well-being. We're very fortunate to have our speaker today, Teresa Comer. She is a Elizabeth Dole Caregiver Fellow and is a caregiver for her husband, Marcus, a retired Army Corporal. In addition to helping Marcus with everyday activities like cleaning, cooking, managing appointments, and monitoring medications, Teresa can often be found advocating at the Department of Veterans Affairs. As a teacher who is often forced to take a lead to care for her husband, Teresa hopes to address this common occurrences with military and veteran caregivers by advocating for more comprehensive assistance for caregivers and their dependents. As a Dole Fellow, Teresa is committed to finding new ways to support family like hers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Teresa Comer. Teresa. Um, I want to reiterate a thank you for having me here today. It is an honor to speak with such an esteemed panel um, about resources that are there that are available. Um, just as a short snippet of how I became a caregiver and what our story is, um, I met my partner in 2008 after he'd already separated from the military. He served in Samarra, Iraq, where he sustained injuries both physically and mentally. Most of his injuries are not those things that can be seen when he's out in public, so he presents as a normal guy to the outside world. However, his wounds of war have led to years of strife with a heroin addiction, multiple suicide attempts, long stays in the psych ward, and a bout of homelessness. Through years of support, finding the right medical teams, and a whole lot of love, um, we have come to a place where we have our new normal. In 2013, Marcus and I got married. Um, a year later, we moved to Illinois from Arizona. In 2018, we became parents and now have a, a family of four. We continue to work through his heavy heart days and I'm trying my best to manage the triggers that he has um, so that he can enjoy his life as much as possible. The picture up there is of our wedding. <laughs> um, these are our two wonderful kids. Um, and a better picture of my partner. Um, General Curta kind of gave a really great overview of the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. Senator Dole um, is the caregiver for her husband, Senator Dole. I know that sounds weird. They're both amazing senators. Um, he's a World War II veteran. And at one of his stays getting care at, um, in the Walter Reed Center, she had to spend a lot of time there too. And she saw all of the families coming back from war and realized that there was not enough support for those families, for those who are taking our soldiers back home to care for them. And as the Doles do, when they see a need, they step up and she started the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. As General Curta said, we are trying to connect the community organizations to really help get more care and support for our caregivers. Um, I know since I started my caregiving journey, um, the growth of support that has happened for caregivers has grown exponentially as in the VA support programs. Um, and so I'm excited that we're here at this point, we're really starting to be recognized and this is just gonna continue. Uh, we did have the Campaign for Inclusive Care mentioned. That was an initiative started with the Elizabeth Dole Foundation and the VA. Um, it is a game changer. It's a huge game changer. 
um, for caregivers. Because we've been in plenty of appointments where I am not recognized and I have not been recognized in the appointment. Um, the veteran is the only one talked to and he has TBI. I know a lot of caregivers that have that. And so he can't remember things that have happened to him. And so being a frontline person, it's very important to include us in that care. We have things that can be, that we can share that um, makes a difference. The mission statement of the campaign for the inclusive care is to empower healthcare providers and professionals to engage veteran caregivers as part of the veteran care team through policy practice and cultural change. So the initiative is really to help those providers understand that we're in the room and we're there to help. Let's come and partner in this journey. Um, there is the caregiver journey map. It is a very helpful infographic for providers to understand the journey that we go on, the difficulties that we are presented with, and then also for caregivers who are new on the journey to really understand where they can reach out for services. You are not alone and you can read and you can find um, some help. If you notice it's circular, it's circular for a reason um, because once we finally have things handled, uh, a new situation usually arises and we start back at um, the beginning of the journey. It helps me as a caregiver myself to keep that in mind when we do hit kind of a crisis moment that we are gonna work through it, we are gonna get to the next step and there are people that are there willing to help. Um, the map orientation roots out the journey that we go on, um, the different points the turning points and as you move from one stage to another um, to really help flesh out that idea of the caregiving journey. Uh, Hidden Heroes Cities and Counties, it was launched in 2016. Um, the Hidden Heroes City and Counties program is a growing network of communicate communities that have dedicated themselves to supporting caregivers. Um, we want to identify, educate and connect um, to date, there are more than 167 communities that have passed a resolution saying that they are dedicated to help our caregivers of our military and veterans. Um, the city of Chicago is one of those, and we are very thankful that they are a partner of ours. Respite relief for caregivers. The VA has respite, but some of that respite services are hard to navigate for caregivers day to day. Um, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation um, asked our caregivers what they need and what we can help them with that, is, that has kind of fallen through the cracks there. And so the Elizabeth Dole Foundation um, has grants given to caregivers um, through care links uh, to get respite relief for things like grocery shopping, uh, cleaning the house, um, organizing a closet that you just can't, have not had the brain space to organize. I myself has, have used this respite relief grant. Um, and the relief that it brought that once a week, I did not have to mop and vacuum one day and spend that time with my kids and my warrior was uh, something that I am incredibly grateful for. Um, to get this grant, all you need to do is sign up with the Elizabeth Dole Foundation through the Hidden Heroes um, initiative. Any caregiver is welcome, any era. Um, it does not have to be a service connected uh, situation. Uh, and then you can apply for the grant and you get 35 hours of respite relief through Care Links. Oh, okay. Um, I wanted to mention two things that I did not put in the slides, um, and it was just over some of the talks that were happening yesterday. Um, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation is launching this year Hidden Helpers, as you guys saw my little Hidden Helpers. Um, even though my son is three, it is amazing how intuitive they are and helping. And as I go through this journey, I am not the only caregiver for my husband. My kids will become caregivers as well. And so we're launching that to really help support them, um, get, get a lot more support all, all, along the road. That was it. Yes. 
<laughs> Thank you again for having me today. Thank you, Teresa. Next up is Blue Star Families. Blue Star Family was founded to empower military families to thrive as they serve. Blue Star Family is committed to strengthening military families by connecting them to their neighbors, individuals, and organizations to create vibrant education, mental health, housing, employment, and other challenges. Here to present uh, community mutual support, Blue Star Family background, uh, sorry, Blue Star Family back, uh, groundbreaking research is raising the nation's awareness of the unique challenges of military family life and their innovative program. It is working to address those difficulties through spouse career development, caregiver support, and establishing sense of belonging among military families, which makes our entire country stronger. And with us today is Mr. Ben Gould. He is a Chicago chapter director of Blue Star Families. He has previous experience working in state and federal government offices, including going from veteran casework. He has spent several years in political organizations and advocacy for nonprofit organizations prior to joining our Blue Star families. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Ben Gould. Ben. Hi, everybody. My name is Ben Gould. I'm the Chicago chapter director for Blue Star Families. Um, Blue Star Families works to build strong communities among, of support among our military and veteran families. We work to support the families as a whole from our programs working with kids um, through our virtual summer camp and our Disney books program um, to working and helping uh, military spouses and veteran spouses to find employment through our spouse force program, which connects employers looking to hire military connected um, people um, and jobs that are conducive to the military family lifestyle. Um, one of our signature initiatives, Welcome Week, um, works to build an, a, a sense of belonging among military and veteran families who have moved um, to new communities and equip them with the support system needed to integrate um, to their new communities and to thrive. Our military family lifestyle survey um, is done annually and reaches about 11,000 respondents that tracks the difficulties that military families are going through and uses that information and data to inform other military and veteran service organizations as well as policymakers and helps us direct our resources directly into the places of greatest needs. In terms of uh, caregivers, our Blue Star Caregivers Program is an annual cohort that meets on a quarterly basis um, where they can share best practices and discuss the difficult um, natures of their jobs being caregivers. Most importantly, it gives them the opportunity to have um, some self-care time. Um, we connect them with a personal um, and professional life coach and send them gift boxes which correspond to that quarterly event from a cooking class to a spa day to a paint night um, and allows them to focus specifically on themselves. If you're interested in joining our caregivers cohort, you can go to caregivers at bluestarfam.org and our website at www.bluestarfam.org. Thank you so much for having me today. Thanks, Ben. Up next is Dixon Center for Military and Veteran Services. Dixon Center for Military Veteran Service has been working at a local and national level to ensure that our veterans, military families succeed wherever they live. They partner with businesses and industries, service providers, and training institutions to effectively integrate veterans and their families into existing community-based programs to increase their impact. Since 2012, 
their collaborative and capability building has impacted nearly 2.1 million individuals and organizations. With us today to represent Dixon Center is Colonel retired Sam Whitehurst. He is vice president at Dixon Center for Military and Veteran Services. Sam retired from the Army after nearly 30 years of service and is currently serving our veterans and their families at Dixon Center. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Colonel retired Sam Whitehurst. Sam. Wow, this is, uh, it's been a long time since I've been up here on this stage. <laughs> so, no, I, first of all, let, let me, I, I do want to, uh, before I talk a little bit more about what Dixon Center does, uh, I do want to once again uh, thank Dr. Terrell Odom, General uh, Steve Carta, and all of the partners who've helped to put on this event over the last three days. Um, you know, I, I came in here uh, with high expectations because I knew Dr. Odom was involved in this. I came in with high expectations and I'm telling you those expectations have been met and have been exceeded. Um, and it, it has really truly been an honor and a pleasure to be up here and, you know, whether it's interviewing a great uh, veteran, a great hero, like Colonel Greg Gadsden, uh, talking to Dr. Uh, or talking to Stephanie Howard, who produced uh, that great documentary, Weight of Honor, about caregivers, and just meeting all of the different folks here in Chicago and, and in Illinois who are working to support veterans and their families. Like I said, it, this has been a tremendous uh, three days, um, and I'm batting cleanup today. Uh, so, um, uh, so I do want to take a few minutes and talk about uh, Dixon Center for Military Veteran Services. And I'm gonna start with our namesake. So on the, on the slide that you see now is a picture of Staff Sergeant Donnie Dixon. Uh, Staff Sergeant Donnie Dixon uh, was, an, uh, was a soldier. Uh, he was a dedicated husband and, and a committed father of four great children. Uh, Sergeant Dixon was on his second deployment to Iraq in 2007 when he was killed in action. Uh, so at Dixon Center, we've taken his name. We had the opportunity to honor his service and his sacrifice and to honor his family uh, every day. But the primary reason that we took uh, Sergeant Dixon's name uh, for our organization uh, was the fact that Sergeant Dixon represents all of the veterans and their families out there uh, that we serve every day and the organizations that we support serve every day. So he's just a great example. Someone who always put the welfare of others above his own. Someone who was a natural leader. Someone who was, uh, like I said, was dedicated to his family. He really represents all of those that we serve, all of our veterans and families. And, uh, and when I say veterans and families, I'm really talking about anyone who has any association with the military. So that's active duty military, National Guard, reserves, uh, military spouses, of course, families, caregivers, and the families of our fallen. So anyone who has any type of a relationship uh, with the military. I need to figure out. There we go. Okay. And you got to be smarter than the clicker. And so, <laughs> uh, so this is, I, this is, uh, I just want to show this one slide here. Uh, to kind of really highlight uh, uh, what we do at, uh, at Dixon Center. So as John Curtis said in the introduction, uh, we are a nonprofit organization uh, that focuses on veterans and their families. Uh, but our approach is a little bit different. So uh, instead of providing direct services to veterans and their families or anyone who has any type of relationship with the military, we work with those organizations and programs who do provide those direct services. So um, uh, our partners include employers, uh, they include union locals uh, and, and union organizations, they include academic institutions, they include other nonprofits, uh, and in some places, uh, in some cases, they include communities as well. So that's who we focus our efforts at, working with those communities and organizations to make their existing programs more impactful 
to veterans and their families. Our philosophy at Dixon Center is that we don't need to create new programs. Let's enhance the existing programs that we have. Let's look at ways to better, better integrate veterans and their families into those existing programs. Um, our work really, uh, our work encompasses three broad areas. Uh, we focus on what we call work with purpose. Um, that's essentially making sure that our transitioning service members, our veterans, military spouses, and their families really have access to careers that provide uh, wages, access to health care, and benefits that really, really allow you to plan a future around. Uh, what we don't want to see is our, our, our veterans, our transitioning service members, our military spouses having to live paycheck to paycheck. So we look for those programs and help enhance programs that provide those skills and guaranteed placement uh, so that you can build, build a, a lifestyle, uh, uh, an entryway into the middle class so you can really plan a future around. And to, to us, that is work with purpose. Uh, we also focus on healing with honor. Um, so as part of Healing with Honor, we do focus on things like health care and access to health care uh, for veterans and their families, but it's also much broader. Uh, we also take a look at wellness, um, and when, when I talk about wellness, I'm, I'm talking about things like, of course, physical wellness and mental and emotional wellness, but also financial wellness, um, also social wellness uh, as an example. So it's a very broad approach to wellness. Uh, and we look for those different programs. They're looking for different ways to accomplish those goals when it comes to health and to wellness. And then the, the, the last area we look at is living with hope. And living with hope is combating homelessness, um, is combating uh, our veterans and their families who are living uh, either below the poverty line or just at the poverty line. And it's making sure that uh, veterans and their families have access to affordable housing. So across those areas, uh, we work again, we work with organizations and communities to help make their programs more impactful. Uh, so again, if you're an employer, if you are a union local, uh, if you're an academic institution, if you're a fellow nonprofit um, and you want to look at ways to better uh, uh, or more effectively integrate veterans and their families into, into uh, your existing programs, I encourage you to reach out to us at Dixon Center for Military and Veteran Services. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Is this still on? Okay. okay. Uh, this concludes the formal portion of the presentation. Uh, we are open for questions and answers. Uh, those of you who are joining us virtually, Please use the uh, chat features, the Q&A features to either make comments or questions. But at this time, I'd like to invite all the presenters come to the stage and we'll do our best to social distance as, as we can. And then whatever the question may be, please step up to the podium and respond to the uh, questions and answers. And Dr. Ronan, do you have any questions or comments from the virtual world? Yes, sir, we do. So uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. The first question we have up, uh, is there an update on the pre-9-11 Desert Storm vets for the enhanced caregiver support with stipends and health insurance? This is coming from Derek Winding, and I believe that question was geared towards VA caregiver department. Teresa, come up to the podium, please. Uh, yes, thank you for your question. No, we have not received an update on that, so we're still awaiting to hear. Um, I believe if you go to the VA caregiver website, you can subscribe to email updates where you'll be receiving information on these and other topics when they become available. Thank you so much. Next question up is actually for Jesse Brown, VA Medical Center. How does the VA start a partnership with a community-based organization 
to assist family members and caregivers. So I believe that's for you, Jess. Yes. Well, it's for both, for Jess and Ms. Catherine, I'm sorry. Yeah, so how do we create a partnership with communities? Yes, how do you start, how does, how would a community organization go about to start a partnership uh, with VA specifically? Uh -huh. I'm assuming that they're meaning for suicide prevention. Uh, as well as to assist family members and caregivers for Catherine. Yeah, reach out to me, email me, call me, <laughs> you know, yeah. Call me, beat me if you want to reach me. I'll give you my contact information and we can get together. That's the beauty of this is that, you know, you have a face and a name that you can actually physically call and reach out. What we, what we are doing is working with community organizations and community members to build coalitions and task forces that are action-based. You know, we have objectives, we have goals that we're trying to reach in the community to deliver a message of hope and prevent suicide among all veterans and their loved ones, service members too. So reach out to me, we'll get that information to you. And um, as far as caregiver support, I think Catherine can better speak to that. Uh, yes, we are excited at the prospect of expanding our community partnerships. And one of my responsibilities as coordinator is outreach to organizations. So you can contact me directly. Uh, I'll just give out my VA cell right here. My VA cell number is 312-933-1501. That's 312-933-1501. Call me and we can arrange to uh, get together and discuss the infinite possibilities of our partnership. Thank you so much, Catherine. This, this other question here, I'm gonna ask if General Curta, if you can answer this one, sir, because this is a great one. Um, Jan poses a question, first a comment. I'm still a little confused. Which organizations, again, will accept civilian volunteers? <laughs> Which organization will accept civilian volunteers? Yes, sir. I think just about every organization, I, I don't mean to speak for, I see all the panelists shaking their up and down. Uh, the, the either good news or bad news is that services that we provide for our veterans and military, they're always looking for volunteers, whether it be the federal organization, state organizations, even community organizations, and definitely not-for-profit organizations are always looking for volunteers. So. If you like to volunteer, check out their website, whether it be Dixon Center, IDVA, Jesse Brown, you name it, IJF. Uh, my guess is every one of their websites have a location or a place to volunteer. So I would encourage you to get involved. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have another question here from Aaron. Thank you all so much for these wonderful presentations today. For those of you working in and through organizations and institutions, is there some aspect of the veteran experience and that of their families that would be helpful for you to know more about? And I would actually think that would be best suited for Colonel Whitehurst as well as for Ben in the back. I know Blue Star Families does a lot of work with their uh, family survey. No, that, that's a great question. You know, one of the things uh, as we engage with veterans and their families, you kind of see, uh, you know, you're, a lot of times you do see some very unique challenges, but again, you do see some, some challenges uh, that we see with our veterans and their families are kind of common no matter who you're talking to. And, you know, and, and so when I'm speaking or, or uh, talking to transitioning service members, for example, one of the things that comes out is uh, just being prepared financially kind of for that next chapter in their life. Uh, sometimes that could be some, some things, I shouldn't say as simple as, because it could be, it can be complex, but it's some, certain things just like it, doing with credit repair and financial counseling. I talked about the idea of financial wellness was up when I was up here. That's why I always bring that up because that, that idea of financial wellness is, is uh, something that we see that we work with a lot of veterans uh, uh, to work through. Um, and, and the other piece is uh, that would focus on in terms of workforce development. And again, I'm not only talking to transitioning service members, but to veterans uh, as well, is that just looking for ways 
to continue to enhance your skills. You, when you leave the military, and I don't care which era you left, you served in, and you left the military, you come in with a pretty recognized set of skills that make you of great value to employers. Uh, but you really want to try to enhance those skills you come out of the military, you know, getting things like certifications, licenses, that could be a commercial driver's license, it could be other types of licenses, uh, certificates, uh, in some cases, it may be degrees, it does not have to be degrees. But again, looking for those credentials can enhance. So that's another area where we see uh, veterans and transitioning service members sometimes struggle with because they don't necessarily pursue those uh, either degrees or non-degree credentials that really help them in the workforce. I, I'm not sure if that answered the question, but but I, you know, I'm always looking for information about that. And of course, it, uh, health challenges that we see veterans face as well. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, yeah, hi, so um, great that you asked that question. We actually currently have our Illinois needs assessment, which is running um, through August 31st. So we are looking for feedback from military and veteran families. Um, you could find that by going to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash BSFCHI, or sending me an email directly um, at bgould, G-O-U-L-D, at bluestarfam.org. And we would love to hear your feedback and opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. This next question, it appears to be two parts uh, for two individuals. This is gonna be Mr. Hernandez, as well as Jessica. I'm sorry, I'm just, I should put my glasses back on. There we go. For Anthony of IDVA, thank you for addressing vet suicide and extended services to rural areas. What do you feel is the biggest challenge? What, what you and Jessica both feel are the biggest challenges uh, to address veteran suicide in rural areas where care is not easily accessible? That's a great question because <clears throat> there's a lot of locations that we do have, the IDVA does have that are currently um, closed and, and especially in rural areas, um, it's just a location, but if you could just go to our website and look up the nearest, we have a link on our website, look up uh, your nearest VSO in your area. And if you're not computer savvy to so look at our website, you're more than happy to um, give our, our Springfield office a call, which will refer you to a local VSO in your area, no matter where you're at, whether it's rural city or what have you. Thank you, Ed. No, that, that's great. I think, uh, you know, I have the luxury <laughs> and challenge of having the catchment area at Cook County. So, um, but I do work very closely with all the community engagement and partnerships coordinators in our network in the state of Illinois. So many of them serve rural areas. And I know one of my coworkers has 36 counties, no joke. But yeah, but there's a program that I mentioned during my presentation called Together with Veterans. So if you go to the VA's website and you type in Together with Veterans, that is a veteran peer-led leadership and coalition program that has funding opportunities. So VA can help you get that off the ground. And that's one of the challenges in rural areas is there's no money. Um, and where the funding goes, that's where the programming can be built and that's where the help can be offered. So I, I think that's one excellent resource. Also, I think really that is the challenge. And I think it was just Jess's uh, slide that presented less than 50% of our veterans are connected anyway with federal VA or even state VA. So in rural areas, that really is the challenge. And I think it's really important to partner with some of the local not-for-profit type of organizations that provide those services in those little communities. And that's why the public-private partnership, and I always mention that not-for-profit uh, community service-based organizations have the expertise, they just don't have the resources. Federal government have a lot of resources, yet they can't reach out to every one of our veterans and, and so forth. So 
partnering uh, both uh, sharing those resources and working with them, I think we reach um, those uh, rural area veterans that we really need to reach out to. So that's what I, I think uh, one of the, a lot of the organization here represents working in those type of communities. I know certainly that's the true in uh, Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs, as well as in Illinois Joining Forces, as we talked about earlier. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, General. Uh, this next question, it's two part. It's actually a comment and two questions, it looks like. These are going to be for Mrs. Coomer. Uh, so to Teresa, thank you for all that you have done for your husband and other caregivers. Uh, it really warmed my heart that you, one, found love, served as a caregiver, and that you continue to be of service to other families and caregivers. Uh, and I, I'm loving this question. When will the Elizabeth Dole Foundation Hidden Heroes Initiative collaborate more with the city uh, and the university? Uh, thanks for tearing me up. I really appreciate that. Um, it's a labor of love. And to answer the question, uh, as soon as we possibly can. <laughs> Hopefully, um, uh, this part, uh, an event like this is how we build these partnerships and that we can um, join together and keep the mission going. Uh, and so as soon as we possibly can get something um, going, we're going to do an event. Thank you so much, Teresa. I think we'll go through two more here. There's a couple of here. I'm sorry, I'm still scrolling here. So uh, Colonel Whitehurst, first, thank you for doing it great for the infantry, sir. Uh, that's a comment. Thank you for doing great for the infantry. <laughs> and the next question is again, sir, um, they would like to know where Dixon Center is based. Uh, where Dixon Center is based. And again, how would someone contact Dixon Center about supporting their initiatives? No, no, another great question, and, and you definitely identified a deficiency in my slides. So, uh, so our office, our, our our physical office is based in New York City, uh, but we have people uh, all across the country. Um, you know, California, all the way to Maine, down to Florida, and all points in between. Um, so, the best way to contact us, uh, go to our website, uh, DixonCenter.org. Dix, Dix, uh, DixonCenter.org. Uh, go to that website and you find my contact information uh, on there um, and, and shoot me an email and, and we'll connect and, and, and see how we can assist. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, ben, I think you said, okay, Ben is still up there. So somebody has a comment and a question for you, Ben. Uh, they say, thank you for welcome week last year. They did get an opportunity to come out and get the Facebook portal. Uh, when is the next one? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad that you um, are very interested in our welcome week. Thank you. It's one of our biggest initiatives and it's starting um, September 25th to October 3rd. Um, we'll be doing um, a couple different events. If you uh, go to our Facebook page, you'll be able to see the registration form. Unfortunately, we're not giving out the Facebook portals this year, but we have different gifts um, that we hope you'll enjoy as well. And we have the Chicago Bears are going to be running um, a youth football camp and we'll have Alta Beauty, who's going to be providing free services um, for our event on Thursday, September 30th um, at Forest All School at 4.30. Still TBD on the time, it'll either be 4 o'clock or 4.30. But if you um, go to our Facebook page, you can register for the event or send me an email. Um, again, the Facebook page is facebook.com slash B-S-F-C-H-I. And my email is bgould, G-O-U-L-D, at bluestarfam.org. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. And I'll just note for the Zoom audience that we will be sharing out all the contact information with all love participants. So you'll be able to see that as well as you go to the University of Chicago's website, the OMAC website, veterans.uchicago.edu, you will be able to see the bios of each of the uh, speakers as well as information about their organizations. Uh, but you could also always reach out to my office at veterans at uh, And I'll have my colleague put that here in the chat and we'll be able to send you that information. And I believe those are the last questions. So back to General Curta. 
I know we've got a huge audience here. Does anybody here in live audience have any questions? Okay, our virtual audience was more uh, verbal than our audience here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, again. And I would certainly like to thank our panel members who presented their uh, organizations. I think they all deserve a big round of applause. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the day three event, as well as the Honoring the Hurt event. Uh, appreciate all your attendance and support. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And this concludes the Honoring the uh, Hurt event. Thank you for attendance.